So hello everyone, uh, my name is Tim Robinson. I'm a AWS well-architected geo solution architect covering Asia. Um, I'm joined this morning by Ben. Hey Ben, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, everyone. I'm Ben Potter and I lead the security pillar of the well-architected framework. So we're going to be spending the next 40, 50 minutes talking through uh, what we deem to be essential AWS security best practices and how we apply those to build in workloads from a well-architected perspective. We're going to go through the security pillar design principles within the well-architected framework, where they're going to talk through the essential uh, practice items within the security pillar. Going to do a bit of an architectural deep dive. We're going to talk through some content that you can use afterwards for self-study. And then if we've got time at the end, we can do some Q&A. So let's start with the well-architected framework. No doubt some of you listening today will be familiar with the framework itself. So for those of you that aren't, well-architected framework is our best practice guide. It serves as a guiding star towards showing our customers how to work with best practice with all of the services that they're using within their workloads. So if we start with pillars, pillars really represent the five cornerstones of architecture as we see it. So these are split into operations, security, reliability, performance, and cost. So with each of these pillars, we have a number of design principles, which really you should see as architectural goals uh, that you seek to achieve within your own architectures. So by achieving these goals, we, we deem you to be aligned with best practice, um, but how do we go about understanding if those design principles are being met? And the answer is simply that uh, during a review process, either uh, us or yourselves ask a number of questions, and based on the response from those questions, we're able to align to see which design principles are being met and perhaps which ones need additional work and concentration. So again, this framework is designed to be run either as a self-service model by the customer, or it can be run in conjunction with AWS architects, or equally an AWS partner that can come in and, and work with the customer to uh, go through a review process, understand the requirements of the architecture, and then make necessarily suggestions which could go into form in a roadmap for the next six to 12 months. So we move on to the design principles for security here. Uh, ben, do you want to just take us through what's, uh, what, what these individual principles are and what their relevance is to customers? For our customers, it's really important that you start with a strong identity foundation. So everything you do in computing and in the cloud starts with an identity, right? So it's really important to have that in place first. And we'll be covering best practices like centralizing identities. So you have all your identities in one place to ease management and reduce that security risk. Traceability is monitoring and logging that you need to configure at all layers of your application or your architecture. So having that visibility of knowing what's going on in your workload. The next is applying security all layers, which is a defense in depth approach. So starting with your infrastructure on your outer edge, all the way through to securing your application and securing secure coding practices. And these things you should automate. So using infrastructure as code templates that we'll be talking through, to automate those security best practices by default. So it's gonna save you a lot of time. And that flows on to data protection in transit and at rest. And typically this comes down to encrypting all data in transit and at rest and providing that protection for your customers. For administrators and even your end customers, you wanna keep them away from data. And you'll hear our CISO talk about this a lot Having people, especially administrators, with full access to all your data and systems increases the risk, uh, especially for human error. They don't need to access that data. They should be using automation and tooling to do the work instead. And finally, it's really important to be prepared for a security incident. And this involves being aware of what you need to do, who you need to reach out to during a security event, and being prepared for it in the first place by running simulations and having runbooks and playbooks in place. 
So then we've decided to call our session today, Security Essential Best Practice. So can you give a little bit of detail around that and why we're referring to it in that manner? Yeah, Tim, so there's a number of best practices in the cloud and we have categorized the essential ones that every customer should be following. That is, if you're a startup with just yourself working for your organization, or whether you're a large global enterprise. So these are the foundation or essential best practices that everyone should be following. That's great. And I love the idea that we can apply the same techniques that we're talking through today uh, to anyone from perhaps a, a small group of architects working in a, in a startup all the way through to enterprise. Yeah, exactly. So we're gonna break these down into the um, into the uh, design principles that we talked about earlier. So we're gonna start off with strong identity here. So again, uh, we covered this briefly in the previous slide, but being able to rely on a centralized identity provider to create a strong identity. So this ensures that we have controlled access to our architecture, which as I mentioned is ideally central in structure. Where applicable, we should use temporary credentials, which are ephemeral in nature to limit potential attack vectors. And these can take the form of tokens with a time limitation. So when that time limitations expire, they can be automatically rotated. Additionally, storing secret information such as passwords should be performed appropriately to ensure that they're accessed indirectly and they're stored in a secure environment. We're going to go through some examples of those in, in the next few slides. Okay, so let's start with a simple example. So we're going to build out an example development account here. So um, customer in this example has got some EC2 instances, some database, some Lambda, and some other core services. So we can see here that we've also built out a segregated management account here. So Ben, perhaps if we start with um, why we would go about doing that, why we built out that segregation rather than holding all of that in, in one single structure. Yeah, it gives the ability to manage multiple accounts. So having core services like Control Tower which allows you to govern multiple accounts. Uh, organizations also allows you to uh, apply guardrails and control and manage multiple accounts. So in this case, we have a single development application account at the top, whereas we could also have a production account uh, as it's a best practice to isolate our development and production activities. And of course, right. if we have multiple different workloads or applications, we can also have multiple accounts. So this is really a, a, a way for our customers to be totally scalable. So as they as they add new functionality, as they add uh, as they add perhaps more staff, they can build these structures out. Yeah, exactly. And we can scale to thousands of accounts. Okay. And here we're we're using SSO. So uh, perhaps a little bit of background about why we why we go down that path. Yes, yeah, so a single sign-on follows the best practice of centralizing identities. So we only want to have one identity provider, whether it's something that we already have or whether we're starting new in AWS, then we can use the integrated identity store in SSO. Uh, but the, right. the key factor is we only want one identity store for our entire organization. Yeah. And again, we can feed into that from a number of external sources, right? Like LDAP and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's right. And again, we touched on this previously, but MFA. So again, using MFA here as that secondary source of authentication um, so that you're not just relying on that single password. So we've now introduced this audit credentials thing. So Ben, can you talk a little bit about that? Why, 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 are, we, why are we placing uh, importance on, on audit credentials and what do they really represent? It's really important that the, uh, the identities and the credentials that are in use are, are valid, right? So if you have mm -hmm. people that, you know, especially contractors that might join your team and leave, it's really important that you revoke the access that they've had. 
and also auditing what level of access they have and following that least privilege model. Yeah. So this really plays what into uh, into what we were discussing earlier about um, having appropriate automation, um, an appropriate process in place for those those sort of uh, perhaps daily or, or weekly occurrences. That's right. And having it centralized in one place like SSO is going to make your life a lot easier in doing that. Brilliant. OK, let's move on. So again, we've got an example here, identical to previous. We've got our development um, account here. We're now going to look at temporary credentials. So we've got STS here and also Secrets Manager. So how are they, how are they working um, to produce those temporary credentials? So you can see we've got a role attached to both the instances, the RDS Aurora, and the Lambda function. So these roles are going to enable us to get ephemeral tokens from STS, the token service. And mm -hmm. that means we don't have to hard code any access and secret keys or any of those credentials in our code. Uh, we don't want to do that. As you mentioned before, we want to stick to using temporary credentials or ephemeral credentials. So now we move on to enabling traceability. So really the ability to configure services and also our application to log, ideally to a centralized point upon which we can uh, start and automate in terms of creation of alarms or, or alerts according to the information that's coming in. So we've got our development account here. As mentioned previously, we're we're segregating, so we've built out an operations account, but also a log archive account. So what's what's going on here, Ben? I noticed that we've got config um, in multiple places, also uh, security hub and guard duty. So perhaps some commentary on 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 why we're operating in this manner with this with this replication of, of services across accounts. Yeah, what we want to do is again in tying in with that multiple account methodology and being able to scale to many accounts and separate development and production accounts. We want to have core security services like Security Hub, Guard Duty, uh, Config and CloudTrail configured in each account. But we want a, we want the the findings and we want to manage them centrally. And that's where we have the operations account down there. We also have a log archive account. So this account is you know, treated like a worm drive. So the accounts right. centrally log all the critical logs. In here, okay. we've just got an example of CloudTrail and the config archive. So it allows us to have them isolated out. So if something uh, bad happens or if we make a mistake, which is mm -hmm. pretty common that people like us make mistakes, then we have those logs that are essentially in the worm drive stored in S3. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point. So, I mean, if we if we were to experience some sort of security event, we've got that archive account there. And because of its uh, nature of being a worm drive, we know it's not been altered or tampered with. So we know that what's been sent there is actually actually the events that happen. Um, this um, let's just go back to this um, this replication of security hub and guard duty. I'm assuming that as we build out um, different account structures, we we do the same thing. So we build out that same roll up approach. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So we want that as a standard across uh, our entire AWS organization. And yep. the control tower service I mentioned previously is going to help uh, provision and apply those guardrails and those services automatically when we provision your accounts. Awesome. OK, so we're going to uh, move to our, our next uh, example here. So again, very similar to the previous one, Ben, I can see we've got we've got roles here associated with our EC2 instances. So we're not we're not having our credentials uh, statically held. Talk to us about what's going on here with with CloudWatch and our VPC flow logs. What's going yeah, on this here? is really diving into the, the logging and metric collection at the application layer. So we're starting off at the top there with the VPC. 
So we want to collect VPC flow logs that will go into either CloudWatch or S3. And then we can choose to keep them for a certain period of time, or if they're really important to us, we can put them in our log archive account as well. But then, right. you know, that's at the VPC layer, right? So diving yep. in to our application layer, we want to get our application and operating system logs off of our instances. We want to get the uh, Lambda logs as well, which will go into CloudWatch, and also the database cluster logs. So we want all of that to provide us visibility and also CloudWatch for metrics. So knowing mm. what good looks like and setting thresholds that might be security related. Awesome. And again, continuing to push all of that information down towards that, that log archive account. So in the event that we need it, we can we can recall it at a later date. Yeah, that's right. And it might be only certain logs that you choose that are critical yep. for your workload to go into there. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, applying security at all layers. So we touched on this previously, but very much applying a defense in depth approach. Um, this is very common approach from an AWS cloud perspective. If we contrast it to uh, perhaps an on-premise environment where uh, we would place a high concentration at the perimeter, perhaps for a firewall or something like that. Uh, from an AWS cloud point of view, we, we really adopt this defense in depth approach. And what this means is, is that we don't rely on uh, a single layer for our security. We, we, we apply security at multiple layers. And again, we do that through, uh, through the use of uh, traffic control. And again, we can go through a bit of an example now. So um, we're going to create these network layers that we touched on. So um, before we even reach our, uh, our workload itself, our VPC, um, really performing uh, checks, uh, in this case at the edge. So when we get, uh, when we get traffic, uh, it, it comes through Route 53 into CloudFront and then into WAF. And again, we're, we're screening traffic and performing a certain amount of DDoS protection uh, before we even enter that VPC. So again, this is being done at edge. Um, so this does a number of things. The first thing is it, it, it provides, as I said, a certain amount of DDoS protection, um, but it also allows to uh, cache some of that traffic. So if that traffic can be served out of CloudFront uh, rather than uh, interrogating our architecture itself, and again, that's removing load from the, the centralized architecture. So as we build this out, we can see that we've got uh, our network layers here. So our public layer at the top, uh, typically with a, a load balancer of some description. Then following that, we'd have uh, a shared layer. Now that shared layer is going to be egress only. So again, uh, another layer of, uh, of security built in there. And then, um, egress from ideally from the application layer and finally we'd have our database layer so how are we going to control traffic at all of those different layers and again we've got a number of techniques to do that um, we have obviously security groups that a lot of you will be familiar with but also knuckles and root tables so using those knuckles at um, at a network layer to ensure that we've got um, appropriate protection, but also making sure that the root tables are applicable to that particular layer. So making sure that, for example, the database layer can talk to the application layer, but not necessarily to the public layer. And again, this allows for segregation of traffic um, and builds on our, our principle of uh, controlling traffic at multiple layers. So then we come on to an inspection and protection component. So um, Ben, perhaps talk us through what's going on here. So we've got cloud formation and we've got systems manager. So how do these come into play in this case? Yeah, so the inspection and protection, as you mentioned, is in the CloudFront and WAF layers. And we can also implement services like the network firewall. But cloud formation here is to use a template, so infrastructure as code template to create all of this. 
And in the links that we're going to be sharing at the end, we have links to our well-architected labs, and we actually have a similar architecture to this that is built out, and we will give you a sample CloudFormation template. But right. it just allows the repeatability for being able to stand this up, and it saves a lot of time. Uh, just like Definitely. Systems Manager there. Uh, systems Manager, so we can use Patch Manager as part of Systems Manager to automate the patching of those instances. Yeah. So we have a number of labs that go with today's session. So this is the first one. And it's called Multi-Layered API Security with WAF and Cognito. They're free to, free to use. So this lab will walk you through the creation of, um, of the components that we're showing you here today. So this, this VPC um, with some Lambda and some RDS in. Um, but really working to ensure that when we build out APIs that they're adequately secured. So in this case, you can see that we've got uh, we've got um, WAF that sits in front of our API gateway, and we're also building out that cloud front layer. So that cloud front layer allows for a certain amount of uh, of screening, um, perhaps from things like SQL injection attacks and so on and so forth. And again, if you look towards uh, the right hand side of the diagram, you can see Secrets Manager there. So uh, Ben touched on this earlier, but using Secrets Manager in this case to uh, perform auto automatic rotation of, um, of the passwords used for RDS, so that we, we, firstly, we don't have to do that by hand and all that's taken care of with automation in, in, in the background. So every periodic cycle, um, those RDS passwords will be automatically rotated. And again, that's feeding in from KMS. So um, at, the, at the outside of our architecture, we've got Cognito as well. So Cognito allows us to create users. So um, even though we've got that protection uh, moving through the architecture, having Cognito there to be able to uh, create users specific uh, to the people that we want to actually use the API adds that extra layer of security. So again, that lab's there for you to try yourselves and we'll include a link at the end. We build these labs together in what we call a quest. So if you've enjoyed today's session and you want to go through and uh, get your hands dirty with, uh, with, with some build out or some sample architecture, then that quest will be available for you at the end of today's session. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next example here. So we've got our um, identical uh, architecture from previously. Um, we've got our uh, edge layer here with Route 53, CloudFront and WAF. And we've also got Inspector and Image Builder here. So Ben, talk us through what's happening here. How are we using this to uh, perform vulnerability management and also to reduce our attack surface? Yeah, we can use Amazon Inspector to scan our instances for any common vulnerabilities and exposures. And that will give us an understanding of how we can, how we should patch and address those vulnerabilities. Because we want to constantly reduce that attack surface. And we want to use images for example, Amazon machine images and container registry images to have a secure baseline. So we're basically starting from uh, secure by default images that are pre-patched, ready to go and hardened. And we can use yep. that using the EC2 image builder and ECR if we're using containers. Yeah. And again, um, looking at being able to validate software integrity, I know you mentioned this uh, hardened AMI. So what, what would we be looking at here and where would we sort of use this approach? Yeah, for software integrity, we want to check the download sources. So a lot of download, a lot of places that you download software from provides checksums and we can validate right. those checksums from the publisher to the checksum that we've actually downloaded to make sure that that software hasn't been edited and it's from our trusted source. And we can also extend this into libraries, especially open source libraries and modules that we might be using. Uh, make sure that we do our due diligence on them and scan them and, and be up to date on what vulnerabilities uh, they have patched in future releases. 
I like that. So being able to check the security right from when we download uh, perhaps an image or, or, or some, uh, some external APIs or something like that, all the way through to uh, injection into our architecture. I think that's great. Exactly. And that's that whole defense in depth, uh, apply security at all layers design principle, right? So we've got all of this infrastructure and we're also doing uh, good security practices at the application layer as well. Yeah. So let's look at our second lab. So again, we're we're uh, relying on um, the use of EC2 Image Builder, which Ben touched on in the in the previous example. Um, so here, what we're trying to do is uh, automate the patching process um, using that EC2 Image Builder service. So in this example, we've built out a, a VPC structure with a public private subnet. And again, we've got some EC2 instances here in an auto scaling group, but we probably want to perform regular uh, patch updates to these. So this lab walks you through um, an example process of how to do that using EC2 Image Builder, which injects into CloudFormation and then builds out a, a mirrored auto scaling group, which we can then seamlessly cut across onto. Again, we've got systems manager here that's going to uh, orchestrate the automation through uh, through documents. So this lab is, is really great for getting to grips with image builder, but also with systems manager and taking you through how you would construct one of those automation documents all the way through to the practice of of um, injection into the cloud formation template and the automatic cut over onto those new instances. So again, Ben, this is what we're saying um, earlier in the session is that removal of that heavy lifting is so important um, in, in today's architectures rather than continuously uh, looking to uh, hire more and more resources, perhaps as your architecture gets more complex, really, leaning back on on that automation uh, and that automation approach to to assist with that heavy lifting and using tools like systems manager to automate so many things that it can do also ties in with the design principle of keeping people away from data so it's keeping your administrators away from directly accessing instances or s3 buckets or other systems uh, in right. aws that you're managing yeah so we'll move on to uh, protection of data. So really this is twofold um, when, we, when we talk about uh, the design principle, really looking at uh, data in transit. Um, so in, in common use using things like HTTPS, et cetera, et cetera, but also enforcing encryption at rest. So um, most of you will be familiar with encryption from perhaps an S3 perspective. But really using native encryption, which is built into so many of our tools, so uh, our, our database tools, as well as our storage tools, to make sure that where we store data, we're, we're encrypting as much as possible. So again, we've got our, uh, we've got our example architecture here. So this time we're gonna, we're gonna include Amazon Macy. So we're really looking to identify data within, within our workload. So Ben, for the listeners that are maybe not aware, can you give an overview of what we'd look to achieve with Amazon Macy in this example? Yes, yeah, so Amazon Macy allows us to scan uh, S3 buckets for identifying sensitive information so it could be things like personally identifiable information or credit card numbers that we shouldn't be storing or we don't need to store. So Amazon Macy can automatically uh, use as its intelligent pattern matching techniques to go over that data in S3 and help us identify what we're storing in there. Great. So again, a number of things that <clears throat> come out from that, the first being that where we identify these uh, these different types of data, we can then move on and perhaps allocate different policies to them in terms of retention or, or something similar. But you touched on quite an interesting point about storing a credit card data. So um, what alternatives would 
customers potentially have if they if they didn't want to store that um, that highly sensitive data within their within their uh, within their organizations credit cards easy because you should just be using a payment gateway provider mm -hmm. and they will handle the processing for you so you, there's no need for you to store the yeah. credit card number. Uh, of That's... course unless you are actually a payment gateway <laughs> in which case you do yeah okay i i totally get that and i think being able to uh perhaps interface with a gateway of that nature means that your your risk is endemically reduced um so i i really do like that idea so we're now going to talk about KMS and um, certificate manager here. So we're really looking to um, implement secure key management, but also to enforce that encryption at rest and in transit. So perhaps Ben, you can give some color around how, how those two services are coming into play um, to, to produce that. Yes, so KMS is key management service. Uh -huh. And it integrates with so many different services, uh, almost all of the services that you have there on the screen. So, for example, we can set up default encryption for all of our instances using the block storage or EBS service. And yep. that will use the KMS key of our choice and we don't have to do any other configuration. It's literally a couple of tick boxes and we're done. And that will secure all of our data at rest using KMS. For in transit, I mean, this is a web application. So in transit, we want to be doing a TLS or HTTPS certificates. And the certificate manager service gives us no cost certificates with automated rotation as well built in. Yeah. And we can tie that in to CloudFront there or the, even the application load balancer as well. Yeah. And again, that automatic rotation very important. So we we covered that previously. I, I I talked about how we how we build that out in our lab to do automatic rotation of passwords for databases. But um, you're you're saying that the certificate manager can do the same thing, but for but but for our web-based certificates. Yeah, and this is where using the AWS managed services can save so much time and effort, and it allows you to move on to other things. Yeah, get it. So uh, now we're gonna go on to um, our last design principle, which is preparing for security events. So this is really, really important aspect um, when we look at security is um, number one, making sure that when we've got, uh, when we actually do get to a security event that we've got access and, and tools already in place so that we can cope with that event. So uh, be that run books or diagnostics tools, but making sure that those are uh, pre-provisioned and ready to use, but also making sure that you run regular event simulations. So the way to become smooth at dealing with security events is to ideally not experience them for the first time during a, during a, 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 a production outage or a, a production event. So making sure that you run these events simulations, uh, perhaps through the use of game days or something like that. Um, again, we work with a number of well-architected partners that, that are happy to come in and, and work with you to run a game day, uh, or indeed run, run them yourselves within your organization. So we're going to talk through some best practices in terms of in incident response. And to do this, we're gonna build out um, our final architecture here. So we've got our operations account. And again, we've got Lambda in here together with Athena and SageMaker. And we've got our security tools that we talked through previously. So Security Hub, Guard, Duty, and Amazon Detective. And again, we've got our segregated log archive account here and our development account with our instances and S3 and uh, some database. So Ben, can you talk us through what's going on here um, in terms of pre-provision? So what are we actually looking to achieve here? What we wanna do is pre-provision our access from our operations account. That is have a IAM role that our responders can get into other accounts really quickly that already has the right level of access to do the reconnaissance, to do the, the research and see what's going on. 
And we and they can do that all from their operations account. And services like Amazon Detective is gonna help them with that, Guard Duty with its findings and Security Hub uh, for its findings and configuration state as well. And I'm right in saying that we've got um, a lab that's uh, that's aligned with this as well. Is that right, Ben? Yeah, that's right. It's actually where the SageMaker there is mentioned in the operations account. So we actually have a lab that you can use SageMaker for. And SageMaker uses Jupyter Notebooks, which are basically Markdown and Python that allows us to have a semi-automated runbook or playbook for doing an incident response investigation. Okay, so uh, we're gonna just talk through some lab and content now. So as we've mentioned previously, um, well-architected labs uh, contains a number of interactive labs. Now these labs cover all of the five pillars that we've mentioned. Um, we've built uh, a quest, which we previously discussed, but a quest is a series of, of labs. Uh, we've built a quest out specifically for today's session. Uh, so that, uh, that's up on well-architected labs now. So just go to the security section and look for the essential security quest. They provide practical experience. Each lab is perhaps an hour, an hour and a half long and really gives you that practical insight into, into uh, where, to, where to go next within your organization. We've also got the landing page here. So the landing page uh, contains the route of our documentation from well architected. So if you want more detail on a particular pillar or you're looking for some specific resources, the landing page is a great place to start. Um, we've also got a link here to the well-architected tool. So the tool acts as a, a, a self-service um, uh, aspect of the console. So you can go in and run reviews yourselves or indeed work with uh, an AWS architect or an AWS partner uh, who will uh, happily come and help you to uh, run reviews within your organization. So finally, the solutions page. Uh, so the solutions page contains a number of vetted architectures. Uh, so please take a look at those. Um, the examples there show how to build out uh, various example scenarios according to best practice. And that really serves as a great educational tool for, for all of you to uh, learn best practice uh, from a practical perspective. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we covered some interesting um, security-based architecture examples, um, and we've covered the essentials that uh, we feel that any customer needs, be it uh, a startup all the way through to an enterprise style organizations, but really including these security essentials in your architecture helps to raise the bar in terms of security for, for all of our users. So. Um, thank you very much from myself. And thanks very much.